Thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, to talk about uh, financial integration in the Nordic uh, Baltic uh, region. Uh, when I'm talking to you today, I do it from a national, from a, a Swedish perspective. But before I get into the technical details of where we are and how one can reflect on this topic, let me start in a very, very uh, general uh, fashion in order to, so to speak, set the uh, stage. In a world with the free capital flows, cross-border banking, and also uh, increasingly integrated uh, securities markets, there are actually limits to what you can do and what, wor what will work when it comes to national financial uh, policies. Uh, one way of expressing this is, uh, is to call it a trilemma. Uh, let's assume that you want to set a national financial policy, and at the same time, you have uh, financial integration uh, cross-border. Well, in that environment, it's not so easy to deal with financial stability issues because, to some extent, they are uh, determined elsewhere. Now, let's, on the other hand, use a, a second example. Let's assume that you have financial integration and financial stability. Well, in that environment, it's very hard, if not almost impossible, to have a very national uh, financial policy uh, framework. And uh, a third example, let's assume that you have national financial uh, policies uh, that are very important to you and that you also maintain financial stability. Well, in that world, it's almost impossible to actually to deal with uh, financial integration. So essentially, what this trilemma says is that you can choose two among uh, national financial policy, financial integration, and financial stability, but you cannot choose all three of them at the same time. And this, of course, is likely uh, to raise tensions at the national level and sometimes also when it comes to cross-border uh, 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 issues. Now, uh, with this as a kind of a background, let me uh, position uh, where we are. And let me briefly mention uh, the agenda that I'm going to go through uh, as you are uh, watching. First of all, if you compare to many other regions in Europe, we have a quite strong degree of financial integration in the Nordic uh, Baltic uh, region. We have a lot of cross-border banking and also other types of financial integration. And this, of course, uh, matters and it makes it interesting to talk about this, uh, these issues uh, presently. At the same time, uh, as you are aware, Sweden is not a member of the European Banking uh, Union. And this, this creates a bit of a dilemma in the sense that either you participate and you have uh, a say and you have a good understanding of where things are going, or you don't participate. And if you don't participate, then you run the risk of uh, becoming uh, marginalized in one uh, way or the other. And that means that uh, some serious choices uh, lie uh, ahead of us. These choices are, of course, ultimately political decisions uh, that will have to be made sooner or uh, later. Now, getting into the, some of the details when it comes to describing uh, financial integration, which, by the way, can be done in many different uh, ways, it's clear that there is a strong financial integration in the Nordic Baltic uh, region. And given that that is the case, that almost automatically uh, creates a need for cross-border uh, cooperation. As you can see on the slide, when you look at the bar charts, uh, the we have large Nordic cross-border banks in all the countries that I'm talking about uh, today. And if you look at other banks in some countries, actually, they, they, they are much uh, smaller than the large cross-border uh, Nordic, uh, Nordic banks. And this has happened in the past, and it has happened over a number of uh, years almost uh, by, by itself. But this also shows that it's hard to ignore the issue uh, cross-border banking in one, uh, in one form or the other, because to a very large extent, regardless of the legal frameworks, regardless of how we look at participating in the banking union, 
these things have already uh, happened. Now, in an international context, I'm talking about a fairly small group of uh, countries uh, today, but a small group of countries with uh, substantial cross-border uh, banking. And this became very clear uh, during the global financial crisis, because given back then the level of cross-border banking we already had, the global financial crisis in a regional context is really, really dealing with cross-border banking and dealing with banks um, running, potentially running or actually running into trouble uh, when they are uh, doing business outside uh, where, yeah, they're, where they are uh, domiciled from uh, the beginning. Now, given that this was clear, given that this is what came out of the 2008 uh, financial crisis, it also became clear that we needed to cooperate more, that we needed to talk to each other more closely than we had done uh, in the past. As an outflow of this uh, realization back in uh, 2011, uh, we created jointly the Nordic Baltic uh, Macro Prudential uh, Forum. Uh, this is a group of supervisors and central bank governors that meet uh, regularly. And in those meetings, we discuss and uh, we coordinate uh, what is going on in our respective uh, financial uh, uh, sectors. And in addition to that, we also e identify risks and discuss risks and to what extent risks are the same or risks uh, differ in the different uh, Nordic Baltic uh, countries. These uh, conversations have been quite efficient and highly relevant. Uh, because in some sense, uh, uh, setting aside the formalities of all of this, all of us are in the same boat in the sense that if one runs into trouble, it increases the likelihood of somebody else running into trouble or all of us actually running uh, into trouble. Now, uh, one needs to be mindful of the fact that when I talk about cooperation in the Nordic uh, Baltic uh, region, uh, one needs to be mindful of the fact that it is quite a challenge because on the one hand, we are quite homogenous. But on the other hand, in a formal sense, we are not that homogenous at all. As you can see on the slide here, uh, we have uh, Estonia, Latvia, Finland, and Lithuania me as members of the Eurozone and also uh, members of the SSM. At the same time, we have Denmark and Sweden being uh, EU members, uh, but uh, not members of the SSM. And on top of that, we have a floating exchange rate, and Denmark has a fixed exchange rate. And then finally, we have Norway and Iceland, and they belong to the EEA area, uh, which means that from a legal uh, perspective, the setup uh, that they work under is quite uh, different compared to let's say, if you are a full member of, uh, of the S uh, SSM. And this is kind of the macro picture when it comes to who belongs uh, where. Now, at the same time, it's also quite a challenge when it comes to who has the right to decide at the national level, because the designated macro prudential authorities uh, differ, uh, and differs actually quite a lot in the different countries. In Iceland, in Estonia, and in uh, Lithuania, macroprudential matters are dealt with, and the decision-making powers rest with the central bank. Now, in the case of Sweden, Finland, and uh, Latvia, uh, uh, macroprudential matters are handled uh, by the supervisory authority. And uh, then again, in Denmark and Norway, ultimately macroprudential matters in those two countries are actually handled uh, by the government. But despite these differences, uh, the structure that we have created, and which has been around now for almost 10 years, is a good structure to keep track of what is going on uh, within the region and to what extent we look the same or we differ when it comes to who is doing what, when, and why. On uh, the slide that is uh, in front of you right now, you can see here uh, 
uh, a number of macroprudential measures that have been put in place in the Nordic Baltic uh, region. I don't show you this slide in order to go into the details, uh, but uh, this is a nice way of summarizing where we are and who has, who has done what over, over, over time. And we have a very detailed framework, uh, which I'm not showing you here, uh, making it possible to, for us in great detail to keep track of uh, what, is, uh, what is going on. And if you look at the red, red line there, you can see that, for example, when it comes to loan to value rules and regulations, all of us, all eight of us, have various uh, loan to value regulations in place. They are not the same. Uh, there are actually some differences here. Uh, but it makes it possible within this framework to in great detail understand, discuss, and keep track of uh, what we have, uh, what we have uh, done. Now, so much about how we uh, on the public sector side have chosen to cooperate in an informal way given our very different uh, starting points. Now, let's take a look at what it actually looks like if you look at the uh, banking, uh, banking sector and what this, uh, uh, what this means. Keeping the previous graph in mind, you can immediately come to the conclusion uh, that with a lot of cross-border banking, reciprocity becomes a quite important uh, issue. Because if you have a mixture at home between domestic banks and foreign banks in one form uh, or the other, uh, then it's very important to deal with reciprocity and the cross-border cross issues because if you do not deal with reciprocity, then one regulatory framework can, so to speak, undo what another regulatory framework uh, tries to uh, achieve. Now, when it comes to the issue of uh, reciprocity, if you look at, for example, on the graph, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, you can see that uh, foreign subsidiaries are very, very dominant in those uh, economies. So from their perspective, of course, it really, really matters how you deal with the cross-border aspects of this. Now, on the other hand, looking at Norway and Sweden, then you can see that foreign branches are actually quite important. And uh, that also, in the case of those two countries, raises the same issues. You just have to deal with reciprocity and when you deal with reciprocity, you need to figure out ways of talking to your neighbors uh, so that there is a common understanding of what is uh, going on. Now, all of this raises, of course, uh, the potential, the issue of potential participation of Sweden in the Euro European Banking Union. As I said earlier, this is obviously a political decision at the end, at the end of the day. Now, one argument for participating is basically uh, the cross-border issues that I'm touching on uh, presently, uh, because there are large externalities uh, to banking and to cross-border banking. And given that all our major banks already are substantially cross-border, that speaks in favor of uh, joining um, the SSM. At the same time, the counter-argument is uh, to argue about the degree of heterogeneity uh, when it comes to banking activities in different, uh, different countries. And that again uh, pulls in the other direction because if you have a lot of heterog heterogeneity, then that speaks in favor of uh, uh, very special domestic rules and uh, regulations. Now then, how do you measure these things? It's not easy to measure these things and one can do it in many different ways. But on the slide that you can see here, uh, and this is kind of an academic approach uh, to this uh, topic, it's one way of describing this. Here you can see uh, very, uh, two indices of cross-border externalities and cross-border heterogeneity. We can argue about uh, how you do this, but this is just, uh, this is just uh, uh, an, uh, an example. With a lot of cross-border banking, or with a lot of, uh, actually with a lot of uh, cross-border capital flows, then there is an externality to this because what you do in one country affects everybody else and vice, uh, vice versa. If you look at this externality index and look at the numbers here, you can see that the Nordic countries ha have a higher externality index 
uh, than, uh, for example, the EU uh, as a whole, if you look at 0.25 on the, on the right-hand uh, side. At the same time, uh, when it comes to heterogeneity, then if you have a low, if you have a low number on, on the heterogeneity index, which is just another way of saying that your uh, financial sector is fairly homogenous, well, uh, then also that speaks in favor of actually doing, having a common uh, framework. And also, if you look at this, then you can see that the heterogeneity index is much lower for the Nordic countries. The Nordic Baltic countries are somewhere in between uh, uh, if you compare to the EU uh, as, a, as a whole. So if you, le if you uh, let these numbers guide you, then uh, clearly there is merit in having some kind of a cross-border pan-European pan system that you participate in. Uh, but then again, uh, this is only at the technical level. Ultimately, as I said, it takes some kind of a political judgment to what extent you really prefer to do so or not. But these, uh, these numbers put together in this, uh, in this way directionally point in uh, one uh, direction. And that's essentially saying that with a lot of cross-border capital flows and cross-border banking, you need to find ways of uh, coordinating uh, one way uh, or, uh, or, or the other. Now, um, as, I, as these numbers show, strong externalities and low heterogeneity in the Baltic uh, region speaks in favor or why uh, we have a lot of uh, financial uh, integration already in the Nordic Baltic region, and that this uh, financial integration so far has been uh, very successful. At the same time, uh, I don't think that one should exaggerate the differences between, let's say, the EU as a whole and the Nordic region or the Nordic uh, Baltic uh, region because these differences are likely to diminish over time because directionally uh, everything moves in the same direction given that the EU continues to work that the, the way the EU has worked for the past, uh, over the past uh, decades. What this also means, uh, if you talk about it as I do from a Swedish perspective, then to some extent we are already substantially affected by what's going on in the SSM because, uh, because uh, the, our major banks are already uh, large in uh, SSM member countries in the Baltic region and in the Nordic uh, region. So already some banks are uh, partly supervised uh, by, the, uh, by the ECB. And that means that uh, there is a bit of a movement there, and some banks may actually prefer ultimately to be super supervised within the SSM compared to being supervised uh, sort of at the, at the national uh, level only. Now, uh, if we were not to join, because that's the political uh, decision not to join, then uh, we run the risk of becoming uh, marginalized uh, over time, particularly when it comes to having some kind of an influence over the regulatory framework, uh, the frameworks evolving in uh, Europe. One way of thinking about this is to compare those countries uh, which are neither Euro members nor uh, members of the uh, SS S SSM. When it comes to our banks, uh, Sweden is uh, largely a home country uh, when it comes to banking and cross-border banking. While almost all, all of the almost all of the other non-euro member uh, Euro countries, they have a much much more focus on host uh, country issues uh, because uh, they are actually host countries and not home countries. Uh, when it comes to where a major part of the banking sector, their banking sector actually uh, comes from. And this you can see uh, very clearly on the slides, which compares the size of the banking sector in the non-euro area in, in, these, uh, in these different countries. If you look at Denmark and, and Sweden on the left-hand side, and here measured as a percentage of the uh, a percentage of uh, GDP, you can see that Sweden and Denmark uh, 
actually have domestic banks dominating the system. And these domestic banks, in turn, have a lot of cross-border banking in other countries in the region. Uh, well, if you look at a, a number of other countries, the Czech Republic all the way to Romania, there you can see it's actually the other way around. Uh, it's, uh, their banking sectors are to s quite, quite a substantial e extent uh, controlled by foreign subsidiaries and uh, branches. So we are actually talking about uh, two quite different types of banking sectors when it comes to not being a member of the SSM in this uh, context. Now, uh, being a non-euro uh, area inside the banking union also has its risk if that were to, that, that were to happen uh, because uh, then you uh, also run the risk of becoming uh, mar marginalized. And that's because non-euro area potential members or members of the banking union do not have voting rights on the general, uh, general council of the ECB. On the other hand, if a choice, if a decision is made to join, there are various safety mechanisms built into, built into the system. So if a country were to strongly, strongly dislike uh, what is being decided by the SSM, you have the formal right to leave the SSM after a while and wander off and do uh, whatever you want on your uh, own. Now, let me make a few final comments uh, which are not really specific to the region I'm talking about today. Uh, but they do have um, relevance when it comes to the topic of, of, of today. First of all, the increased integration uh, in Europe is an ongoing process. This is not something that happens from one day to the next. This is something that's gradual. It is something that takes uh, decades. From in this perspective, to uh, engineer and to create an integrated capital market in Europe is uh, a priority from a financial uh, sector perspective. And it's also an important topic uh, for improving things when it comes to the evolution of the real uh, economy within uh, the EU. Now, when things change over time, and when things change over time gradually, it's rare to find new institutions and new structures being put in place ex ante, so to speak. Usually, you create new institutions uh, once there is a problem or once things have changed so much so that you come to the uh, conclusion that your old, old structures won't do the work that you uh, want the old, old structures to, to deal with. And that means that usually there needs to be a common understanding that new uh, institutions can and will produce uh, value added in one form or the other, and that whatever uh, structures you had in place in the past have become, in some sense, uh, uh, obsolete. And that creates an environment where, over time, you intend to accept uh, changes, provided that those new institutions also can show that there is some value added in this process. Now, I have spoken uh, today uh, about uh, these processes and what, it, what things look like in uh, my region uh, of Europe, but I do, and I have talked to you uh, from a very national Swedish perspective, but I do think it's important finally to keep in mind that uh, when we are talking about these processes, there are actually positive externalities uh, that are good for everybody. So sometimes it's not just enough to talk about these things uh, from a strictly national perspective. Because if these processes are run smoothly, is if uh, capital flows increase, if we have more and more uh, cross-border uh, banking, then everybody will uh, benefit uh, uh, from that. And the sum of the whole is probably more than uh, the sum of the individual uh, pieces. Thank you for uh, watching.